Hi, I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center, and it is my honor to introduce our exhibiting artist, Ken Little, prominent American sculptor who has brought wonderful things in a variety of media to our gallery and has agreed to talk with us about what he's got here. And thank you so much for being here, Ken. Oh, it's, it's been a pleasure, and I would like to thank the, the East Hawaii Cultural Center for their support, and particularly Andres for his uh, great installation, and uh, the work looks terrific. I'm really happy. Now, this is the first time I've seen it, you know, I, I haven't been here yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen the work in my studio, but I haven't seen it here, <laughs> and it looks terrific. Thank An you. Andre Kramars, of course, is our curator and gallery director who put up the show. Let me do a little introduction. We're both professors, so I'll do it yeah. that way. Uh, Ken has his BFA in painting from Texas Tech. He has his MFA from the University of Utah. And what were you doing specializing in there? Ceramics. Ceramics, okay. Oh. And I understand that ceramics is where you started. Yes. Well, painting is where I started because as a, as a child, uh, my grandmother, Sis, was a china painter. And she was my favorite. She was a soprano in the church choir and, <laughs> and a lot of times my babysitter. And, and she uh, allowed me to paint china with her when I was a young child. I'm pretty sure that's why I became an artist because she was very supportive. <laughs> she t gave me this good advice that I was always supposed to sign and date my work. Oh, gee, how many China painters know that? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, so I went to college, started to go to college, and uh, my father, who was actually graciously paying for it, wanted me to do something else. So I studied architecture for three years mm. until we took a figure drawing class. We had to take a figure drawing class. All the architects had to take a figure drawing class in mm -hmm. order to draw figures into our pieces. Sure. But listen, drawing those figures was a lot more fun than, than <laughs> drawing remember. the rooms <laughs> in architecture school. So I went over to a counselor and I said, uh, hey, uh, you know, I'm an architecture major. He said, yeah, this is Dr. Clarence Kincaid in, uh, at Texas Tech. And, and I said, and I, but I'm, uh, I'm interested in being an art major. What would, I, what would I do? And he said, oh, you just teach in a college. And I said, oh. Sign me up. <laughs> so I became an art major and was a painter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then through another series of consequences, I was getting ready to graduate. And I went to Dr. Kincaid again and I said, well, I'm getting ready to graduate. And he was looking at my credits and he said, well, you haven't taken any of the other classes besides painting. And I said, well, that's what I do. And he said, no, you have to take printmaking and ceramics and sculpture. And I said, oh, OK, whatever. So, I, but the first time I sat down in ceramics with, with a potter's wheel and felt it, I was like, whoa, this is what I want to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I had a wonderful teacher named Dick Evans, uh, who, so, so I really graduated in painting, but uh, the, the painters kept saying, where are, you, where are you all the time? I was over there working in ceramics. Uh -huh. uh, and then I went off to the University of Utah for graduate school, and uh, mm -hmm. there became interested in all kinds of art. And sure enough, you ended up as a teacher. You said you had yeah. three tenured positions at Missoula, Montana, Oklahoma, Norman, yeah. and for most of your career, looks like Texas, San Antonio. That's we right. Just retired yeah. as Professor Emeritus right. in sculpture. Yeah, and I've had a wonderful uh, run at that. I have had wonderful students who become my good friends and colleagues all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and it really kept me uh, out of my shell as an artist because every two days a week I had to go in and like talk to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Read <laughs> papers. And, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so it was, it was a blessing mm -hmm. to have those kind of colleagues. And I've, and I've had very good colleagues too. I've had Great. some bad ones, but mostly they're, they're out there. there. On the margin, they were better. And you exhibited very widely all over the U.S. Yeah. You've had shows of the, oh, my wonderful favorite WPA. Yeah. DC yeah. and Smithsonian exhibitions yeah. at the Renwick and yeah. let's see, uh, Honolulu Academy of Arts, yeah. which is now, of course, the Honolulu Museum of Art. That's how we found Hawaii. Oh, great. Okay. Ah, so you didn't have the connection yet. Well, the connection with Hawaii came through, uh, I was brought to Honolulu to do mm -hmm. a ceramic workshop mm -hmm. uh, by, at, at the University of Hawaii. And while we were there, they had us stay with Thurston Twigsmith mm -hmm. on, at his house. 
And uh, while we were having dinner, uh, uh, we ha through our conversation, he, he has said that he really liked his wife, Lila, at the time, really liked Deborah Butterfield's work. And, uh -huh, sure. and I said, well, I know Deborah. She's a friend of mine in Montana. I can mm -hmm. put you in touch with her. Well, she got in touch with her, and they bought enough of John and Debbie's work that, that John, uh, that they bought a house over here. Mm -hmm. And then John said, Ken, come and you need to come stay in the house. So I, I started coming to Hawaii in the summers. Okay. And then uh, basically, when I sold a building uh, in about 2002, I uh, did a flip with a real estate thing mm -hmm. to buy a, I, it was a rental property I owned. I bought a house here that was rented until about four years ago, and now we don't rent it anymore. We Great. come here. Well, with the idea that this would be my retirement, that half half of it would be here and half of it would be in Texas. Fantastic. Let's take a look at some of the work. Yeah, sure. And speaking of Honolulu, um, well, the most prominent thing in our show here are the big animals made out of shoes and belts right. and all sorts of stuff. And I understand that uh, Fury is in the. Honolulu Museum of Art yes. Collection now. Mm -hmm. Oh, gee, maybe. Yeah, maybe. and that was a piece from the '80s. That's a, it's a big uh, pig made out of baseball gloves. That's on a Plymouth Fury. <laughs> on a, pl I didn't catch the connection. Yeah. Okay. A shell, one of the shells, like the shell uh -huh. from the from the Ford. How about maybe, pick one of these and walk us through it, would you? One of the animals. Sure. Um, well, let's start with this. Uh, this deer over here, because okay. uh, it would relate to how the shoe animals began. Okay. Uh, I was a ceramicist through the 70s, <laughs> and like I say, I went through all these different variations of the media, and then uh, basically was, was looking for another way to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> because there was a huge uh, Secondhand culture in Missoula, Montana, you could go buy all kinds of interesting, weird stuff. And I, would, I went and bought things like mannequins and things like that to work with in some sort of three dimensional collage. And I bought a deer uh, form, taxidermist form, that had been uh, sort of abused. The nose was rotten off and the eyes were out. And, <laughs> and the poor uh, thing. The, the fur was rotten and a couple of the horns were broken. And, and uh, Missoula was a big hunting culture in the 70s. And, and, you would regularly be sitting at a stoplight and, and someone would pull up their car and have a deer on the, on the, on the fender. Mm -hmm. and, and so I thought, well, that's really a crummy thing to do to, to like kill this animal and disrespect it that way, uh, mount it and disrespect it. So I bought that and just out on, on a whim decided I would try to give it some respect back. Of course, it was kind of a weird way to do it. I, first, I sheathed him in lucky beer cans because mm -hmm. those were what the but so it's what the bear hunters drank when they, or the deer hunters drank. And then uh, I fixed the horns and I put some plastic wood in the eyes and painted the eyes in. And then I started to put, I cut an old boot up and I started to put the boot on the nose. Ah. And when I put it on there, I thought, holy, oh my gosh, I'm putting it back where it came from. <laughs> I'm taking this skin that was used from this animal and I'm putting it back on the animal. And when I first made them, they scared me to death. They were they were very Frankensteinish. They were <laughs> they were really sketchy, and, and I and, and they bothered me. So where were they coming from? This was Missoula, Montana. No, no, I mean from inside you. Well, for me, they were uh, uh, well. Uh, from this, there's also a screen of this of this synesthesia stuff that I could talk to you about about that one. Okay, tell us about synesthesia. So what happened was. Uh, I started making these things and then I used the patterns of the shoes and the patterns of the cords and now the patterns of the Hawaiian shirts and the, you know, the patterns of the, the boots to create this uh, vibrancy, this, this visual vibrancy that mm -hmm. would create a certain kind of tone or a hum, you know, uh, and, and, I, and that's actually the way I know when they're finished. I tune them, so to speak, to the right hum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, <coughs> I, I, can, I can look at them and hear them mm -hmm. uh, or smell them hmm. and feel them, uh, uh, the certain kind of texture that, that I, you feel. Hmm. So it's, so it's, it's, it's visual, uh, it's, it's transferring the senses of looking at something that's patterned in red and yellow and white and blue, but then getting a, hearing a tone in your head, like what that would, 
and what that would uh, be, uh, or feeling it sort of rippling up your back, you know, feeling it. So, is that why all the electrical cords? Well, no, that one was that happened just actually working on this show. I had been very uh, neat and tidy about making sure that everything fit on the uh, on the skin itself, and using the cords, what, what happens when you put a lot of shoes on this thing is it starts to look real busy and you lose all the form. But then I was using the cords like we used in drawing school to, to do, do contour lines to bring back the form. Oh, okay. And also to look kind of like blood veins and things like that or nerve <laughs> endings. But then they be started to become uh, uh, sort of synesthetic patterns on their own. Uh, and then when I was working on these pieces, I, was, I had some old pieces I was redoing and I'd taken the cords off so I could work on them and the cords are hanging down there and I really liked the fact that it looked like it had just risen up out of the mire or the, <laughs> you know, it was like a moose with stuff all over it that has risen out of the swamp. I see. And, uh, and, and so it really gave them this dystopic look that I enjoyed. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. what I went with, you know, in terms of that kind of thing. Okay. Well, Andre suggested to me that I look at these as trophies. Mm -hmm. Hunting culture, but not just hunting culture, but materialistic trophies. We got high-heeled yeah. shoes. We've got Aloha shirts. We got dollar bills. Boots. Yeah, all Cowboy sorts of boots. interesting things in the skin. Mm -hmm. All kind of mm -hmm. speaking of trophy. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious that they're trophies. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole taxidermist thing is, is a little weird anyway, because <laughs> the rest of the body is somewhere else, and all you've got is the head sticking out of the wall. Yeah. And uh, I've got some pretty good cartoons that people give me over the years of, of, of uh, animals, you know, going, <laughs> I I'm understand thirsty, I need a drink of water, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You were now, telling they, me that it's sort of a... An interesting experience collecting some of these styrofoam forms from the taxidermy yeah. people. Well, also these pretty well function within the arena of painting. Okay. Because you have this, you have this blank wall behind it that uh -huh. gives you all this quiet space and this idea that you can look at it like a picture, mm -hmm. you know, these are in the room with you. Mm -hmm. If you don't watch out, they're going to bite you, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know, so these are sculpture, these are painting. I see. And, um, I mean, they're, they're just sort of thicker paintings with a lot of stuff wadded on them. Wow. But these are sculpture and these are ones that, that have presence that basically you feel. Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk a little bit about these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is called Kamapua'a, mm -hmm. and for Hawaii people, we know that that is the pig boy god of the Hamakua coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's got some kind of local resonance for us. Yeah. And on top of him and yeah. under his little buddy here, there are petroglyphs. Right. Where does that come from? Well, uh, when I first started making the show for Hawaii, I wanted there to be parts of Hawaii <clears throat> in there. And I really have always thought that those petroglyphs were so beautiful and meaningful in terms of uh, the people that they came from and, and the things that they did. And so I started trying to figure out ways to do uh, modern petroglyphs. And basically, I, I failed pretty, pretty, pretty uh, spectacularly at that, but, <laughs> but I ended up with things that are, in a way, caricatures of those things. I see. Let's um, take a look at maybe some of these petroglyphs up here, if we could. Yeah. These are a little bit clearer on the wall and oh my goodness. I noticed they come with some disclaimers, a respectful and playful approach to the formal aspects of the beautiful spare right. ancient Hawaiian petroglyphs. Exactly. Because those things are sacred things, you know, and I didn't want to disrespect those things. Of course. I wanted to, in a way, rift on them the same way a jazz player would on a, a classical score. Uh, and so I hope that that's the way that it's taken uh, and not as a disrespect to the wonderful uh, traditions of, of traditional Hawaii. Do they come with an iconography for you or are they more just, as you say in the label, just formal responses? Formal responses. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have a, a, a 
a spreadsheet on, on the symbols. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the prints. And here I would like to yeah. ask about the iconography. Well, you these have, prints you have were actually, prints in the show. Yeah, these prints were made in Hawaii at, at the Donkey Mill Art Center in collaboration with Hiroki Maranoi and, uh, and the people there. Oh, these were and, made in Hawaii. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, this particular print, uh, Butler. <laughs> that's my name. Uh, is it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Has, has all the images that I was using at the time. Hands, suits, airplanes, houses, rabbits, um, and things like that. So basically it's a, it's a graphic collage presentation of a selection of images that I was already familiar with or using. And, and these again refer to what we talked about earlier, that they're all masks. It's a mask of a bunny, it's a mask of a house that's a mask, it's a hand that's a mask, it's a suit that's a mask. It's an airplane that's a mask. So they're all masks that we wear one way or, or participate in one way or another. I see. Now, what's the hand doing? The hands, these, these, this was something that I got interested in about what happens between your body language and what you're saying and your expression. You know, uh -huh. if I were to go, ha, ah, well, <laughs> my hand does this, you know, or if I do like, you know, I, your hand mm -hmm. does that. So I started putting the hands on, I mean, the, the, the facial expressions on the hands in the bronzes and, and the drawings so that this would be like, hi, and this would be like, please. And this is like, ah, I need it. You know, oh. This was desire and this was please. I so see. So this was, this is like this and like. It's like almost that. like a Hindu mudra. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So That's it was basically a, a very simplistic look at, uh, uh, you know, body language. I see. Oh, that's fascinating. Now you mentioned bronzes. How about we walk over and take sure. a look at the bronzes? We have all sorts of different media in this show and they stretch over your career. And hmm, let's, right. oh, let's start with the ceramics actually. We okay, mentioned well, these, that that's where it all began. Yeah. Well, I was saying that a lot, almost everything I do I see as a mask. And these were, uh, I've made a lot of animal masks, which we will look at in a minute. And these were uh, some uh, Raku pieces that I did with my friend Hiroki Moranoi uh, when I was first visiting here in the early 90s. And uh, so, uh, so basically it was trying, again, the ceramic vessel form or the, the hollow form, uh, with a few holes in it, it becomes a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what these were. And these are reference, these reference a couple of things in, uh, are historically, they, they reference uh, ancient, uh, you know, clay figures and things. Uh, uh, Temple from, offerings. From all, from all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, primitive, th primitive ish things. But then they also reg re uh, reference uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons <laughs> like Bugs Bunny and you know uh -huh. and, and that kind of stuff uh -huh. uh, because that's the stuff I grew up with sure so it's stuff I really love like the like the Eskimo uh, Klingit masks and things like that mm -hmm. but also uh, Bugs Bunny yeah. so, so it's a cross between those kind of things when I was reading your biography I noticed that a lot of your your artistic and musical heroes are people who dive deep into pop and yeah. have a humorous aspect yeah. uh, in ceramics, Robert Arneson, right. and oh, your your music buddies. Let's see, yeah. oh, David Byrne, Buddy Holly, right. those guys. That you seem to be very interested in kind of crossover between pop culture, pop music, pop imagery. Well, I've always media. been a fine artist, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the, the funny thing about fine artists is they work in a studio. Usually can, it can be noisy, but my studio was usually quiet because I wanted to hear the pieces. And then I would make these pieces and I would carry them to a very quiet space like this museum. And I'd put them on the wall quietly. And then they'd sit there in the quiet, you know, uh -huh. while, you know, while a few people walk by and maybe like them or something. Yeah. Well, if you're a musician, you do something and you walk into this noisy room that's full of people mm -hmm. and you do it in front of them. And, and the biggest response is like, yay, you know, everybody's 
clapping and everything. Well, that doesn't happen in a museum. You know? <laughs> At least we hope not. <laughs> so when I started writing songs and playing, and I have friends that do that too, uh, the, the relationship between a musician where you want to, to be in a crowded, noisy place where people, uh, you know, yell at you and stuff like that, mm -hmm. as opposed to being in a quiet place where people respect your work, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> that's, that dichotomy has fed me because I, you know, I can be a musician, I can do those things in a popular way for popular culture, mm -hmm. but I can also do these for a fine culture where, I mean, you probably know that it's a big pothole if you get too popular. Oh yeah, in the visual art world, because then you're <laughs> then you're sold out, you know. And so I didn't ever want to do that. Yeah. But when you're when you're going on stage, the first thing you want to do is sell out. Sure. <laughs> you know? sure. So I, I should mention that yeah. uh, Ken is a musician as well. We actually have one of his albums here right. on sale, "Simple America." And so he knows whereof he speaks. Right. <laughs> These. Uh, I, I did this album and my brother Mark was very instrumental in helping me. He's a wonderful world-class jazz musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a work of uh, a collaboration. That's the other thing about music is you do it with other people. Sure. Art you do by yourself. Yeah. So um, that's why I like kind of going back and forth between them. That's interesting. Let's take a look at the bronzes. I sure. Keep, we keep tantalizing you with talk of bronzes. Oh, wow, these are spectacular. These really fascinate yeah. people when they come into the gallery. Well, these definitely make reference to, you know, ancient uh, masks. And then also, as, as I said, to cartoon characters, uh -huh. uh, contemporary cartoon characters. I, I wanted uh, them to be masks. I wanted them to look as if the brains and the, and the eyes and everything had been removed. And all you have is, is this sort of thing that covers your face. Oh boy. And that is again what, what the cars were and the houses mm -hmm. uh, and the fan and the suit were the same things. And uh, these, uh, I, when I was working on the, the shoe animal pieces, the, uh, the cords and the animal pieces, I had to put on a coat of paper mache in order to hold the screws and everything to hold everything together. Mm -hmm. And when they were bald like that, just these bare forms, I really liked them. But they were full of this styrofoam and, 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 and they needed something else. So I went to my friend Harry Gefford, who ran a bronze foundry, and I said, I'd like to make these things just be shells. Is, mm -hmm. can, can, and he, he showed me how to go through the bronze process and make make a, wow. a clay positive and then make a wax uh, negative in, the, in a mold and then cast it in bronze. That's so classical. Was that yeah. difficult? Of course it was difficult. To oh learn. yeah, it's, it's incredibly uh, difficult. I mean, so, Harry made it look easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really complicated process and, uh, and I'm so grateful that he included me in that. Um, it was funny because, you know, a lot of the stuff that they did at the foundry, you have all these, if you know if you don't know if you're familiar with bronze casting, but you have to put a lot of sprue things on there, a lot, right. a lot of entrances for the metal. And then you cut all those off and then you grind it all off so that you don't see those anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wanted to make mine as empty shells inside, which presented a real problem for the founder because they usually go inside and you know leave, the, leave everything in there, but I had to grind them on the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And- uh, So it's what, a clay core inside? Well, it ends up being, uh, it, oh, it's a it's a it's a it's a wax form that looks just like this, but it has all these feeder things that go right. in it, you know, and that have to be cut out and ground down on the inside. Mm -hmm. These metal uh, troughs that take the bronze into the form, and uh, so I was the only artist that he worked with that worried about uh, what the inside looked like, because he would <laughs> weld them all together and you wouldn't see all that stuff on the inside. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm an art historian. I'm used yeah. to the inside just looking like ick. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I see. I wonder, have you ever made actual wearable masks? Or I, I imagine these are not wearable. No, these are a little heavy mm -hmm. and uncomfortable to wear. No, I was more interested in the metaphor 
or, or the symbol of the mask than I was making costumes. Mm -hmm. I, did, I have done a lot of performance in my career. What kind of performance? Uh, all kinds of, uh, but mostly using things like uh, suits that I would sew cups all over. So that okay. when I walked around on stage, they go clink. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. uh, and other suits that I had uh, silverware and forks and knives sewn across mm -hmm. and uh, they did the same thing and I used them in uh, uh, used them to, to emphasize that that kinesthetic thing of like if you make a movement it goes okay you know it's almost like the cords hanging down yeah off the yeah. animals huh yeah. huh Interesting. I wonder if we could maybe talk a little about, more about animals as animals. Yeah. Um, I've been reading some of your, your literature about you, and I'm still having a little trouble kind of figuring out where you're coming from with the animals. You're not an environmental activist as a first concern. So it's not, not like your first concern. I think there, I am, I am, I'm not an activist, but I believe in that, those things. Uh huh. I, I loved your talking about these particular animals not being representations so much as being the things that inhabit our unconscious, the things mm -hmm. on the edge of the forest, the yeah. things just beyond the picket exactly. fence. Yeah. And I was thinking, I'm a medievalist, I'm thinking of those manuscript pages which so often have little illuminated bits of animals mm -hmm. peeking out through the pages, doing yeah. strange and disturbing things in the middle of your gospel book. Well, um, Again, I, you know, started as a kid being interested in things because we, we, we would go outside and play all the time. So we would go, go get horned toads and, <laughs> and different things. Horned toads. Yeah. See and horned toads there. Early on, we got, a horn we got, toad over there we got the BB cramps. guns and we became, you know, hunters out in the, in the forest. Uh-huh. Or not the forest. There wasn't a forest around Amarillo in the landscape. And so there was the natural thing. And then, then also there was the thing on Saturday morning TV mm -hmm. where we saw animals in a totally different way. Oh, sure. And then they could talk and, you know, and, uh, and bounce back from being squashed and you know, <laughs> all these different kind of things that uh -huh. happened in the cartoons. And, uh, and then, I, and then I really liked the idea of looking at the things that, that came out of Native Americans culture, mm -hmm. uh, the, where the animal is, is a revered thing and, and they, they would take on the, these, they would take on this whole thing, a spirit soul of the animal in their, mm -hmm. in their, in their uh, process, in their dances and their things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, that all is rolled into pop culture too. I mean, it, it's not any one of those things yeah. that, that made it. It's just that all those things were together to, hmm. to do that. Maybe if we could look over here and look at some of the layers you bring to this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is a beautiful exhibition. Thank you. Um, just wondering, as, as we're walking, our curator, Andre Kramars, is filming this. Yeah. Hi, Andre. Would you tell us a little bit about what it's like working with him as a curator? <laughs> it's too much fun. <laughs> Andre is terrific. He and I have a great relationship, I think, and I have really enjoyed uh, interacting with him about it. He's, and I've worked with all kinds of curators forever. Uh -huh. uh, Andre's, Andre's is an artist himself. Andre's has ideas about what he wants to do, and that's good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that that also creates tension with some artists who don't want the, the curator to take over their mm -hmm. part of it. I'm sure there are stories. And, uh, but Andres and I have, have developed a really good relationship, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because like I say, I've had, had ideas about how I want this to be an environment and have pigs walking through here and things <laughs> thrown around on the ground, you know, and Andres wanted an exhibition like this. And this is, and then, you know what? It looks terrific. I'm really happy with it. So oh, good. I'm I, uh, very positive about his uh, input. Oh, that's and great. his uh, professional uh, treatment. Oh, that's great. Well, let's take a look over here and see what we've got. Um, I was interested looking at these 
It just the, the varieties of skins these guys yeah. have. <laughs> and I wonder if you could talk about maybe how that's evolved. You've been doing sculptures yeah. like this for a long right. time. These are new, right. it's all new work. Yeah. But uh, how have they evolved over time? Well, these particular ones um, <clears throat> incorporate not only just the shoes and the belts uh, and, the, and, and the clothing, uh, which is the Hawaiian shirts, but a lot of paint. You might also notice that uh, these particular ones, uh, not this one, but this one and this one mm -hmm. are left and right. This, this is the pink side of the, the pig. This is the money side and the blue side of the pig. <laughs> and I can't help okay. but reference that painting that Matisse did with the, with the stripe down the middle yep. of the woman's yep. face. Sure. So that half woman of it with was a blue one stripe. thing. Yeah. And, I, and I used it in the studio as a, uh, as a device to say, okay, you're gonna make this half of it pink, this half of it blue, and might still make it work. Uh huh. You know, <laughs> and it's uh, it's a, it's a strictly formal device that you know sort of came into play with these things. Okay. And also, uh, I wanted to start adding uh, the, the dollar bills and the uh, or like I say the Hawaiian shirts for this particular uh, show. Sure. Uh, Let's see, where are some Hawaiian shirts? They're in here somewhere. Well, it's right here, the Marlins. Oh, that's right, the, the lovely Marlin jumping around. Uh, these, these are just like the pattern of the shoes, you know, that work gotcha. on the piece, and then the belts. And so the whole, the whole thing, uh, there's a, there's a two-dimensional <laughs> image of the Marlin, and then there's a three-dimensional image of the shoes. What fun. And this one has the dollar bills that go in the, in the shape with this, uh, belt mm -hmm. and then the flowered shirt which you see a little bit over here and a lot over here where where uh, the uh, the flowers make up this pattern that uh, again generates for me this sort of kinesthetic response of a certain tone or certain uh, a certain feeling that 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 is tactile I see and I think I own that shirt <laughs> you may have probably. Would you tell us a little bit about the dollar bills? Uh, they pop up here and there. Yeah, and... I uh, strictly came to them in a in a sort of a formal sense in my studio practice because I was making paper mache things. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I, when I when I made all my my dummy forms that I was going to put shoes on, they were all bald in the studio with this brown paper on them. I thought. You know, these look pretty good as just things themselves. What if I made them out of, out of some kind, different kind of paper? So I started thinking, well, what kind of paper <laughs> can I make them out of? That's a different kind of paper. And uh -huh. I thought, well, dollar bills, Bible pages, dictionary pages, you know. Uh, and so I started making things out of different kinds of paper. Uh -huh. And uh, that's when I made, uh, uh, started making, I made a portrait of my father out of dollar bills because my father was, that's what my father was interested in. And I'm really interested in the dollar bill because the dollar bill is this abstraction. This, mm -hmm. You can't eat it. You can't make love to it. <laughs> you, can't, uh, you can't do anything with, to it. You can do it with it, mm -hmm. but not to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's like this uh, abstraction that is, has this picture on it that we all agree is, has some worth. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to agree and I have to agree in order for you to, me to give it to you and you give me a hamburger. <laughs> you know, and uh, in Hawaii, that would be more than one dollar. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> so I, I like the idea that this was a, a meaningless, basically, thing that functioned on faith. Uh -huh. That that this was going to be that you could do something with this, and then uh, that sort of ballooned into uh, uh, using it in, um, to make figures and to make clothes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to make now, uh, I put that one on uh, as a. These, these, these petroglyph things were sketches. Interesting. You know, they were as I did them. I, they were sketches because mm -hmm. I was using the format of the petroglyph and then putting my stuff on it uh -huh. to see what it would be. Uh -huh. And uh, so that one is basically a, you know, dollar bills on on that on that form and. Uh, so it basically becomes sort of the modern Hawaiian petroglyph. I see. You know, 
as opposed to the channel, uh, one that's uh, chiseled into uh, mm -hmm. lava rock. Now that's interesting. In um, your statement in our, our little brochure, yeah. you, you say you want to share your aloha yeah. with the island. Could you tell us what, what would you like specifically a Hawaiian audience to get from your work? Or what, what did you put in it specifically That's Hawaii? a tough one. Uh-oh. Uh, because uh, I don't really think we can understand the Hawaiian culture. We, we can understand the culture through our eyes, mm -hmm. but we can't be Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm conflicted about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love being here. I love it, but I'm also know that I'm the, I'm the biggest invasive species that ever came to Hawaii. Aren't we? Mm -hmm. and, and so, <laughs> so I have a certain love and for the for the island and everything. But I also have a sadness about what it lost because mm -hmm. we came. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I don't know. It's a tough one to answer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not trying at all to be. I'm really trying to be respectful of the Hawaiians, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm sure that some of them would go along with that, and probably a lot of them would not. Mm. They would say that no, you're not respecting this, you know. In fact, mm -hmm. you're disrespecting it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I I don't mean any disrespect. Mm -hmm. uh, I really mean to talk about the way that, at least, it appears today. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's so few authentic Hawaiian voices, mm -hmm. you know, it's mostly mixed up in everything else right now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's interesting to me because our previous show was in fact gifts to Mauna Kea, uh -huh. and we had a, a, a number of prominent Hawaiian cultural practitioners who participated mm -hmm. wonderfully in the exhibit. And this is as interesting and from such a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it would be really easy to take it disrespectfully, enough, but I do not mean it that mm -hmm. way. Sure. Uh, so. Well, let me ask another kind of cultural angle. I'm from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. I'm from upstate New York, basically Canada. Um, your work, I think, and your career look what I would call Western. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something specifically West? Well, you've talked about the hunting, but. Do you find that your work in Texas is different from your work inspired in Kona? Not really, because I haven't made much work in Kona. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, you know, I am more or less retired as uh -huh. an artist now, in uh -huh. a Duchampian way. I do things now that amuse me, but mm. not not things in a big way necessarily. And um, so. Um, What's the question? Uh, do you find yourself in a different mindset, really, as an artist in Texas and in Kona? Oh, okay. Well, yes, but that's because I make it that way. Because I don't. Okay. I mean, Texas, I have a full welding wood shop studio uh, with a bronze facility, mm -hmm. and here I have a, a, a two-car garage with a with a table saw and pencil. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the uh, it doesn't it doesn't. Uh, quite equate, uh -huh. but, but also I am, I am 72 years old mm -hmm. and I've had a wonderful career, which I'm very proud of and very satisfied with mm -hmm. uh, that I'm retired from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and like I say, I, I want to uh, now just sort of support young artists that are coming on that I believe mm -hmm. in and also uh, try to, uh, bring you a smile every now and then, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it yeah. sounds pretty stupid, but, uh, you know, if you grin at these rabbits, I, I think that's a good response. I don't need a, 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 a postmodern hypothetical analysis of their form and function and, <laughs> and their Freudian symbolism, you know? Good, because I can't draw that out. Well, I think that, <laughs> that's a wonderful note to, to end on, maybe. Yeah. Um, and we certainly are enjoying the show. People coming in are, are getting a chuckle, but they're also scratching their heads, which yeah. I think is a nice combination. Well, that's, 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 that's the perfect result as far as I'm concerned. Oh, that's great. <laughs>